All righty. I think we are live. So hello, everyone who is joining us today. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Megan Faulkner, and I'm the program manager for the Summer Academy to Inspire Learning, or the SAIL program, based out of the University of Oregon. Uh, so we're super happy that you've joined us for our weekly college and career workshop. We have with us today three wonderful guest speakers. We have a panel for you today uh, to talk about careers in architecture. So before we get started, I do just want to remind everyone that this presentation is for you and for your benefit. So our goal is to share some of the skills and knowledge you'll need on your journey to higher education and kind of spotlight some of the things um, that higher education can help you do in the world. So please go ahead and use that chat function that you see on our YouTube live page. Um, we're reading all of those questions. We have our sale mentors in the chat to answer questions. And then we will, um, if you have any questions for our presenters, please ask as many as you have. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the presentation, they will go ahead and answer your questions, anything about architecture or school or the career. Um, so we will get those answered for you. So without any further ado, I'm super excited to turn it over to our presenters. Thanks, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Serena. And um, before I introduce myself, I'll just say that um, the three of, of us work at Raul Broca Architects in Eugene, um, Oregon. And um, we're going to just give a really quick introduction. And then um, in, in each introduction, we're going to share um, one of our favorite places or one of our favorite architectural experiences that we remember. And we welcome you to, um, as we're talking, if you think of something that you remember that you really enjoyed, to just put it in the chat so that um, we, can, we can see what your experiences are. Um, no experience is too small or too big. Uh, so feel free to, don't be afraid and put something in there. Um, so I've been working at Ralph Broca for um, two going on three years now. I graduated in 2018 from the University of Oregon's um, track one master's program. So track one means that my background is not in architecture. Um, my, my, my first college uh, degree was uh, in visual arts and humanities. So it was a lot of um, drawing and painting and some animation and media production, uh, studying cultures, a lot of writing. So a lot of different things. Um, and my favorite place is going to be actually a two-parter. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen which I, oh, I, I could have done that, Should, could have done that. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, and, okay, great. So my, my first, the first part of my favorite place is, um, is a very simple and small architectural experience. It's a um, wood framed cabin. <laughs> Um, and these are these three uh, are different pictures of different cabins at the same camp in the Sierra Mountains, um, not far from Yosemite National Park. Um, and my family used to go there for about a week every summer um, to vacation. And so I have a lot of really fond memories. And you can, as you can see, it's a very rustic. There is no electricity in our cabin. So this was our little home for uh, a week. And um, yeah, just really loved spending spending time out there in the fresh air. One of my favorite things about this was was this quality of light that you see um, on the canvas. That's the roof of the tent, and of course, it's very beautiful um, to wake up in the morning to something like this, with the sunshine coming through the trees um, onto your fabric roof. <laughs> um, so then the next. Uh, the part two of my favorite place is, um, I'm gonna switch here, just so we can do a little traveling <laughs> since we're all, um, for the most part, stuck where we are. Um, so here we are in Eugene and the, the other place I wanna share is um, a museum. Ooh, sorry, hope no one got 
<laughs> Big there. Wow. Um, a museum <laughs> in <laughs> in Paris. So um, so it's in Paris, France. This is the Seine River, and the it's called the Musée d'Orsay uh, or the Orsay Museum, and it's right next to the Seine River. And there's a lot of really cool public spaces around it um, where people hang out and just look over the river or do whatever, hang out with friends. Um, and this used to be a big uh, train station. It was built around the year 1900. And then they've converted it into a big art museum. And um, what I really love about that art museum is when you're on the inside, <laughs> the ceiling is this translucent glass um, and you get this beautiful daylighting inside. And all the little galleries off to the sides are, um, are controlled electric light, they're darker rooms. And so when you go from one gallery to the next, you get a little breath of fresh air in the middle um, of that experience. And I got to spend the afternoon there just by myself, which I thought was wonderful. <laughs> I could wander around at my own pace. And um, I noticed just how the light changed as the sun changed in the afternoon. And so I just kind of totally fell in love with, with that, pretty much just that ceiling, <laughs> the roof <laughs> in the Musée d'Orsay. So that's my intro and I'm gonna pass it on to Andrew. Me, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Andrew Cohen. Um, I've been working at Raoul Brokaw for just over a year now. Um, I recently moved um, back to Eugene from Boston, um, where I was living for the previous seven years or so. Um, so in total, I've been working in the architecture for pr profession for eight years. Um, I am also a graduate of the University of Oregon um, architecture program. Similarly to Serena, um, I uh, went as a master's student um, after getting a um, undergraduate degree in art and uh, visual arts. Um, I'll be talking more about that um, a little bit later. Um, but very happy to be back in Eugene. Love working at Raoul Brokaw. Um, it's been a very exciting time to, to come back um, for this part of my life. Um, and I'm going to share a, um, well, one, my screen, mm -hmm. and um, tell you about a experience I had with my brother. Um, so this is me, that's my brother who is normally not this excited. <laughs> he's, a, he's a wonderful guy, I love him, but but a little bit more like toned down and, and serious and not at all interested in architecture. But we went to this building in Barcelona and it like turned him into this happy giddy little kid. Um, and I'm sharing this story because it was the moment where I, I finally believed that architecture or a space could um, really move someone. Um, when I was in school, the professors would talk about, you know, the power of design and the power of architecture. And um, as someone interested in buildings, like you start to believe it, but you also are skeptical. Like, is this, is this just fluff or is like, is there something real? Um, and so we are in Barcelona um, and the middle of town is this um, church called La Sagrada Familia. Um, designed by a, an eccentric man named Antoni Gaudi. I'll make this big. Um, and one of the many interesting things about this building, other than it looking like uh, a Mario Brothers castle or a Minecraft video game, um, is it's still under construction 140 years after they started it. So these cranes are, I mean, this isn't a current picture, but if you went there today, it would look pretty much the same, very much under construction. Um, and it's, I, I liken it to a melting sandcastle. You know, I just think of going to the beach and you put your buckets of sand in and it just kind of like droops eventually. It has that quality to it. But when you 
see it up close. There's just like so much detail and just like creativity everywhere. But the real power is when you go inside, and this is inside the crossing of the church, um, is the the ceiling and the the just dynamic nature of all the um, all the columns, the stained glass, the skylights, just everything creates this like robust explosion of of design. It's just like it's unlike anything um, I'd ever experienced. Um, and in this moment, um, when my brother and I are walking around, we have our dorky headsets on, listening to the um, to the pre-recorded guide, and um, Alan taps me on the shoulder. And he has his jaw dropped and he goes, is this not the most incredible place you've ever seen? And, uh, and I, I just like, it clicked with me. I was like, he's feeling it. Like if Alan can feel like a space move him in this way, then like, it's real, you know, like a, all of this was a, someone or a group of people's imagination brought to life. Um, and it really does um, impact one's emotions, one's state of mind. Um, and, um, I know it was just a, a really good moment in my, um, in my process of becoming an architect of, of learning it to, to practicing it is like, it, um, it does have an impact on people. And that is all, um, I have for now. Oh, Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Young. I'm the elder statesman here. And first, I want to apologize. I'm not going to be looking at the camera because I have a little laptop and I can't see it. So I'm looking at my big screen. So that's why I'm not looking at you. So <laughs> apologize for that. Um, I, I have been practicing for over 30 years. Um, uh, I've been at uh, with Raul Brokaw. I'm a principal at Raul Brokaw. I've been here for um, about 11 years and I've been in Eugene practicing as an architect for about 25 years here in Eugene. Um, I, I went to school right out of high school, to architecture school right out of high school in California over 35, no, 40, wow, 40 years ago. <laughs> so, um, so there is a track to go right out of high school and, and we can talk about, you know, advantages and disadvantages later, but um, I came out, you know, into architecture school really green and, and not knowing a whole lot about the world, but just having an interest in, in making things. And so I'm gonna show you my, maybe not my favorite space, but one that's really has, has stayed with me for a long time. And this also takes place in Europe and this is a common theme. Um, there are great places all over the world, even in Eugene, but a part, part of a, Part of I think what draws us to architecture is seeing new things in new places that we're not used to. And so, um, like I said, I, I had never been out of the country um, when I went to architecture school and I had the opportunity to actually spend a couple years of studying abroad. And on one of, uh, and during these studies, you get, you know, you get time to travel around. And so um, after a few travels, I realized that what I like to do is I like to just walk through towns that I'm not used to. In America, there, you know, our town, and especially in the West Coast, our towns are maybe 100, 150 years old at the most. And, um, and in Europe, you know, you're going through Roman towns uh, that are, you know, millennia old, a couple thousand years old. And, you know, the Romans, you know, uh, had all, sort of had occupied all of these spaces. So there are little Roman towns all over, all over Europe. And so I read about this little place in Portugal, which is over here called Evora, that um, it said, oh, it's an old Roman town, had, a, had an aqueduct. So I decided, oh, it'd be fun to just wander around a little unknown town. Now, for those of you who might not have studied Roman history, aqueducts were one of the the big uh, engineering feats of Romans uh, because they needed to get water from one place to another and there were no such things as machines and pumps. So basically you had to get water from a high, a high altitude location like a mountain down to a city. So they built these bridges, or we, they call aqueducts everywhere. So on the top here, there's water running and uh, it just went across 
uh, the whole countryside and it, it got lower and lower as gravity got lower. So basically they built a river from, from, the, from the mountains. So that's, uh, that's one of the initial things that got me to interested in this town. But really, like I said, I like to just travel around and wander through cities. So here's Portugal, Spain, Evora is just this little, little town in the middle of Portugal, not even one of the most famous towns or anything. And so this is what a typical old Roman town looks like. So if you think of our cities there, you know, there's basically a grid of, of big wide streets because they were made for cars. But uh, in the Roman days, there were no cars. They may, might've been made for carts, but really made for walking. And they just, they just grew out of maybe a main plaza and then just grew out of that. Uh, and it's really fun to wander through the streets. Uh, this is that plaza here. And, and sure, every plaza has, you know, their, their um, sort of the famous landmarks of a city are usually like the plazas, the monuments and the churches. But I really like to just go wander around through these small streets. And this is the scale of the street. And, and basically it's like walking through a maze and you discover little shops and little, and, and little houses and see how people live. So I was just wandering through these, this is a typical street. And I, uh, you know, sort of got caught up in just seeing, seeing the structure of the city. And then I came across this little rock wall and, I, and, it sort of, and there were these little arches under there and, I, and it sort of reminded me, oh yeah, this is an aqueduct town. And I, I sort of figured there'd be an aqueduct outside of the town that I can go visit later on. But I, so I sort of followed this and as I followed this, it got taller and taller. And then I realized that, wow, they had, this used to just be an aqueduct for water, but they had actually built their city into the aqueduct and built their buildings into the aqueduct, which is uh, just <laughs> sort of a neat thing. So the, you know, the, the, the aqueduct was built you know, over 2000 years ago, and maybe these houses were built maybe 200 years ago, and they're constantly you know, re remodeling it and everything. So I thought that was just sort of neat. And um, you know, this is the aqueduct as it goes outside of town. This has been restored uh, it, um, so that it looks like what it was when it was new. And then this is a aerial view of, this is that view of the aqueduct and you can just see it winding its way into town. So this is where I was walking through and you can, if you look in, you can see, sort of see how the houses are poking in. So I, I think the thing that I like about it is, is that these, um, part of it was just, you know, you build on the history of a place and you just um, you adapt to what, what you have. So you don't always have to tear things down but um, the interesting thing about a place like this is that there are no like special feature buildings or anything, but on a whole, the whole city is interesting. And I, I, that's part of what, what um, I enjoy about uh, architecture and special spaces. So it's not just about buildings, but it's about places. So um, what we're gonna do is um, each of us are gonna talk about a little aspect of architecture and as, as We've introduced ourselves. You can see that Serena is, is, is fairly recently out of college and starting, starting the profession. Andrew's sort of in, in the middle of it. And I'm, I wouldn't say at, at the end, but I, 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 I'm sort of at the last third of my career. I think before we do that, we wanted to check to see if anyone has uh, put favorite places down. And it looks like there, there are some on the, on the chat here. Um, Leaning Rome, Leaning Tower of Pisa, uh, the curved structure everyone knows from the Sydney, the Sydney Opera House. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's an awesome building. Uh, any structure that looks like it's defying gravity or is barely balancing. Mm. Ah, yes. Ooh, yeah. You can Most think Italian it. traditional architecture. Man, a lot of you have either been to Italy or you got to go there. Those really tall tower structures that look so traditional in Japan and Korea, probably pagodas you're probably thinking of. Aztec architecture, yes, yes, right, right south of us. Mm -hmm. and I really love geometric glass ceilings. They look like clear kaleidoscopes. Yeah. You might've seen a part of that from Serena's. That's my jam right yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. The, the structure that looks like it's defined gravity it makes me think of um, the Jewish art museum in San Francisco, it's like, in an old building, but they did this huge addition that's like looks like a huge sideways cube, and you can almost like walk under it. And mm -hmm. that's like it's a crazy experience looking up at it when just from the outside. Um, I like haven't really gone inside 
much, but I, I love walking past it. <laughs> you could Google that and check it out. Yeah, those are great answers. Yeah, thanks that for is, sharing. Uh, love those too. Okay, well, I guess I'll kick it off in terms of um, talking about what architects do. And I'm gonna share screen again. And I am actually just going to talk really in general about um, a little bit about what in general architects do, but also um, tell you about our, our firm because we, we, we are sort of like a, a typical architect in a way in that we do lots of things. Mm -hmm. so, so first of all, um, our, our firm is in Eugene. Uh, we, we're downtown and um, I'll show you some pictures of our building because that's one of the things we're sort of interested in. But this is what an architect's office looks like. We have 22 people. Um, currently, um, no one, oh, I think Jim is working there right now. But as you can see, we're all working at home. And that's sort of how, you know, as, as you all know, how it's, how it's been for everybody. But um, just the way architects' offices are, are usually very open because we work collaboratively. We talk to each other. Um, we work in, in teams and groups, and I, I think that's really one of the important things about this profession is that it's really collaborative and not one person or one firm or one uh, company um, is responsible for making buildings happening. Um, just some other, this is just looking down our hallway showing our open office here. Um, this is our typical workstations. So each one of us has a desk that, that um, goes up and down and Usually there's a computer there and either two or three screens, but it, of course these are home now. <laughs> uh, this is a, you know, we, since we are have open offices, we do need conference rooms. So sometimes like if we're doing a Zoom meeting, we, we all can't be out in the open doing that. So we have uh, uh, some rooms that we can uh, have some more privacy. Uh, one of the things we do is we create a lot of visual material. So on our back wall, we have projects and we look at uh, like different different designs for different possible designs for different buildings. So it allows us to just gather around and look at things on a, on a whole wall. Uh, of course, we have some support, some open spaces. We have a kitchen and, uh, you know, like most offices, but, you know, we try to keep it really open and casual. And then we have an extra room we call our bonus room, which is uh, a lot of what we do are, is look at different materials and we have, this room is basically just full of materials. So interior materials, windows, and a lot of it is selecting products for, um, for buildings. So um, what does an architect do? Well, um, you may think that, um, well, architects are responsible for, for making buildings, but um, the making of a building is, is is really about uh, three entities. One is an owner who wants the building done or is gonna pay for the building. The other is the design team of which architecture is, the architect is a part of. And we, we think of the building and make sure it works and design it to work. And then the third entity is the contractor who actually builds the building. So those are the three main entities. Now with it in, in the design profession, the architect is the one who's sort of like the center of a hub of a lot of different people. So we work with structural engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, electrical engineers, sometimes acoustic experts, theater experts. And we have to synthesize all those into a building. And we have to understand a lot of, a lot of what, uh, all of those aspects, not deeply like an engineer, but we have to have enough general knowledge about a lot of things so that we bring that all together so that we can um, describe how to build this building and what the building looks like to both the owner and to the contractor. So I'm gonna go through a couple projects that, that we do just to show you the range of, of the types of things we do. So this is our office from the outside. Um, some of you may have gone by here. It's uh, along Willamette Street between 13th and uh, between 11th and 13th, uh, there's a Claim 52 brewery and and um, and uh, um, a, a coffee shop and other things down there. Um, this is us. Uh, it, it, it's it's you probably shouldn't be talking about this to to students, <laughs> but uh, it it helps. It's, it's sort of nice to live above a have our office above a brew, brew pub. So every once in a while we get together. But I just wanted to show you the, 
you know, some, some of us here, not everyone's in here. I, I think Andrew and Serena actually are not in here, but, but you know, pretty, pretty casual kind of, of group here. Um, so we do a lot of different types of projects. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a few that are in town. We work mainly in, in Lane County and in Eugene. So there may be buildings that, that you're familiar with. Uh, we do educational work from, from uh, K through 12 to community colleges to colleges. And a couple of the K through 12 buildings you may be familiar with is um, the new ATA Middle School, um, uh, which used to be Jefferson, but I think most of you know it as ATA. So um, uh, we did that uh, about five years ago and just some shots as you look through that. I'm not, I don't know if anyone on the, um, in the uh, who's listening either has gone to ATA or either the old ATA or this one. So uh, this is, uh, you need to be familiar with this if you had seen that one. Let's see, another project uh, in 4J that we've done was, uh, the Churchill STEM school, which is now actually being converted to a wood shop. So if there are any Churchill students there, you, you're probably familiar with this one too. And this, this was the, the building that used to way back when was an auto shop and a wood shop. And we converted it to the, to the, um, to a STEM type building. And, um, and ironically, we are under a project to convert this room back to a wood shop. So uh, one thing to learn is that building uses aren't permanent and they change. And um, just like that aqueduct, <laughs> things, things um, change all the time. Oops. Let me go back, sorry about that. Okay, so we, we also, and I won't go through all of these, but just na name off a couple, a couple of other um, education type buildings we've done that you might know of. Um, we worked at Lane Community College. We did a, a, an art school there. Uh, we do quite a bit of work at the University of Oregon. So Straub Hall, um, um, a lot of interior pieces. We just did the new uh, Tykeson Hall, which is on the main quad there. And then we do quite a bit of uh, science labs uh, at the U of O. So um, these are just interior remodels, but very technical work that requires the understanding of the scientific process and, and specialized systems. Uh, we do some what's considered community work. So we've done, uh, we didn't do the Holt Center itself, but we did the lighting, the new lighting scheme for the Holt Center. Um, we've done some community centers around Oregon. We do some um, lane transit district projects. We did the Gateway Station over at uh, Gateway Mall and we're currently working on the River Road Station up River Road. Uh, for anyone who lives up there, you might have noticed some construction going on over there. And then we do some multifamily housing. So um, as opposed to single family houses, these are like apartments and condominiums. Uh, one of them that you might be familiar if you're in that part of town is the Amazon Corner. And this is uh, sort of near the Albertsons on, on 29th and, and Hilliard. Uh, and so this is, uh, uh, these are apartments uh, with some uh, shopping underneath. Uh, another one that you may know if you live in North Eugene is Crescent Village. So we did uh, the, all the buildings, uh, the main big buildings at Crescent Village, there are a lot of other houses, townhouses there now, but the, the main street down there and the buildings around there, we, we've done those. Um, and outside of town, we do a little bit of, of work, uh, notable work that we're doing now is in California, we're actually doing um, housing for homeless, for the homeless. And uh, this one is in particular was for homeless vets in Eureka, California, but we're we uh, subsequently have about four more projects for, for homeless housing in, in mainly the north of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. 
Uh, commercial work is for private businesses like our own Northwest Community uh, Credit Union. You might be familiar with this building, which is uh, near the river, um, sort of near the new court, the uh, courthouse, which is that shiny metal building. And uh, let's see. Uh, we go over to another one, planning interiors. We do in, uh, purely interior projects. Uh, sometimes the interiors are related to our whole buildings like the Northwest Community Center building, but other times their they're buildings already there and we redo the interior. So this was for Roseburg Forest Products. This is an old, a building right off of I-5 I on, on in the Beltline used to be a furniture store, then it was actually Northwest Community Credit Union. Um, now it's a forest products uh, company. So you can be fun, we have some fun with that. Like uh, since it's a forest products company, we did some windows that have sawdust in it because they produce a lot of sawdust. And we used all of their, their products within this, uh, within this interior. So that was sort of fun. And yes, we do do some single family houses, not a lot, um, architects, there are some architects that work solely in this in doing single family houses. And so that's part of architecture too. Um, usually the size of the firm and, and how your, how your firm, firm builds up sort of uh, uh, puts you, makes you more capable of doing certain types of projects. So even within um, housing, uh, single family houses, there are architects that will do like really expensive fancy houses and there are some We'll do really sort of uh, humble houses for, for, for everybody. And that really um, uh, translates to even work we do. Um, there are some architects that maybe only work on museums or only work on apartments or only work uh, in the universities. Um, or some, you know, some, some only do K through 12 schools. Uh, one of the things that we do is we have quite a variety of work. So as, as you just wanted to convey that, um, uh, you know, we do high schools, uh, we're doing the new North Eugene High School, we're doing the new residence halls at, at the U of O, if you see that are going on near Hayward Field, we have some more multifamily houses. Uh, we had a study and maybe doing the, the new steam plant down on the riverfront. This is something that Serena was working on, was working on. And I mentioned the Santa Clara um, River Road uh, bus station that we're doing, and then some of the homeless housing uh, that we've been doing. So um, yeah, so that, that's, that's really uh, just a, sort of an overview of what you do. I just wanted to finish off on why I, I enjoy it, even after 35 years, I've never gotten tired of it. And part of it is because of the variety of work that you see, we're not doing the same thing every day. And we're actually learning every day because uh, there's so much to learn uh, that no one can actually, you know, know everything. And it's it's just fun to be curious about new things and figure out new ways of doing things. And it involves a lot of different types of skills. I I went into architecture because I didn't like to write, and I took drafting classes. And I said, well, it'd be fun to draw all the time. And I find I do very little drawing now. But but what I found I really like is is learning about all the other different pieces that um, specialty pieces and, and even writing sometimes and, and just the creative process in, in getting a building done. So I mean, with that, I'm gonna hand that over to Andrew. All right, I'm back. Um, You're muted, Andrew. Am I still muted? Am I still muted? I can hear you. All right. Can anyone hear us? Or? Yeah, Serena can hear me. It might just be you, Mark. Well, I will continue on um, hoping everyone can, uh, can hear me. So I'm gonna um, share a little bit about my path um, into the architecture profession um, because although I'm in the middle of the career, it's, it's still on the, the early side. If Mark's on the, the back third, I'm, I'm definitely in the front third. So it really wasn't too long ago um, that I was a high school student uh, and entirely directionless on 
what I wanted to do, um, professionally what I wanted to do in college, where I wanted to go to college. And um, like I'm sure some or many of you are experiencing those around you, your friends, your family um, are asking, you know, what, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Um, and I didn't have much of an answer. So my mom, this was a, a very memorable moment. She just asked me, you know, well, what do you like? What classes do you like in school? Like, what do you enjoy doing? And um, the answer was, I liked art. I, I loved my art class. It's the only one I was particularly engaged in and excited to be in. Um, you know, I did fine in, in school and all my other classes, but they didn't um, they didn't get me excited the way art did. So um, that set my path for the next few years entering college. Um, however, uh, once I got into a more serious art program at the college level, I learned quickly that I'm, I'm not an artist. What I am is I, I like making things. You know, I like using my hands. I like being creative, but I'm, 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 I'm not an artist. So it was another process of figuring out, well, okay, what can I do if I know I like making things, if I know I like technical things to a certain degree, I know I love people. I love interacting with people. I like being a part of a team. Um, so what can I do with these skills? Um, and while I was going through this thought process, I, um, my, art education went from drawing and painting into sculpture and doing a lot of woodwork um, and becoming more like utilitarian, like things people could use, or um, I'm gonna, I guess I can show the slides um, here now. Um, but it, it went from this process of just visual arts to things um, people use. Uh, and it all clicked that architecture could be a really good fit for me in that it combines all of my interests, but also results in um, this very useful uh, end result that is immensely collaborative, incredibly creative. Um, and so towards the end of my undergraduate um, college experience, I did a summer program um, at U of O, uh, which was an introduction to architecture for people coming out of high school or um, like me who are in college or even after college and they were in a profession and wanted to switch and they wanted to learn about architecture. Um, so I did this summer program and it was just kind of like the aha moment of like, oh yeah, this is, this is what I need to do. Um, and so after that, I, um, I finished up my um, art education then went to master's, uh, went to U of O for the master's program. Um, oh, I need to, hit share screen. Hold on a second. So here's some high school artwork, drawing and painting. If anyone can uh, identify who this is, uh, there'll be some sort of reward, um, although I'd have to figure that out. So the clue is it's a musician. Uh, and then in college, some sculpture work. So um, little pieces of, um, you know, furniture, um, this is like a jewelry box, some shelving, um, this is a ukulele um, I made. So the funny story with this is I was taking a uh, physics of musical instruments class while I was in a, my, you know, sculpture program. And I had this like moment of, I thought it was a good idea. It was really ambitious and I had no idea what I was getting into, but I was like, I'm gonna make a musical instrument not knowing it's like really hard to make a musical instrument, but sometimes when you don't know, you just start doing something um, and it works out one way or another. Um, and then as I um, started thinking about architecture school, I started playing with these like scale models of, um, I don't know, it's just kind of this abstract river crossing of forms, um, neither here nor there, but um, shows the segue into architecture. Um, which is kind of the blending of all the um, the visual um, art forms while also um, thinking about the, the end result of occupying a space. Um, this was a museum uh, up in Seattle. The Nordic Heritage Museum was a design project we had. 
Uh, all right, so uh, the profession. I want to illustrate um, as best I can the the process of um, of practicing architecture. Um, and at its essence, you start with conceptualizing um, a building. I mean, we we talk a lot about buildings, but it doesn't have to be. It can be outdoor spaces. They can be purely interior spaces. Um, they can be big master plans of whole cities or um, new areas in um, uh, undeveloped areas of, of an existing place. Um, but for this presentation, we're just going to talk about the building. So a owner, in this case, it's a real estate developer. They want to build apartment buildings. So, and they have an idea of roughly you know, how many apartments they, they want to put on their piece of land. So um, we will put together visual, visualization. So I say conceptualize. We say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Developer, this is what we propose uh, for your building. And that's a whole process. And historically, that would be a, a sketch on a piece of paper. Now we use sophisticated rendering tools, which make it look more real than it probably should, but they're pretty cool. So this is where it all starts. You conceptualize it. And then you have to document it. You have to put it in paper. So everyone's probably heard uh, blueprints before. Oh, this is what blueprints are today. Um, they're drawings on paper. So you have elevations, you have some details um, of the different parts of the building so someone can go in, um, and build it. Uh, then you get to construction. So the contractor um, leads this effort, however, we are involved throughout that process um, to answer questions because the documents we put together, um, things may change, or uh, when you go to put it together, it may not um, come together exactly as you drew it, and you need to um, help the contractor um, resolve um, certain conditions. Um, so as an architect, you go to the site a lot, you observe the construction, making sure what you drew is what they're building. Um, and then in the end, you get to enjoy what you created. Um, and so uh, these examples are from when I was living in Boston um, in an apartment building I got to, got to work on, um, but was also a very active shopping center um, with great eateries. Um, and it was just a fun place to hang out. There was a movie theater. So in the end, it's like you get to go there just as a civilian and um, and really enjoy um, you know all the, all the hard work that went into making this the end result. Um, so another example um, here's a outdated office building. Um, a new uh, owner, uh, a new person bought this building and they wanted to give it a facelift to attract. Uh, more um, high-tech uh, businesses to occupy the building. Um, and so they thought opening up the entry, making it more visible, get better signage would help attract new tenants. So we put together uh, some ideas of what that could look like. And then here it is in the end of um, that new facade. There was also more to this particular project, but just wanted to highlight the, the process of, you know, you, you start in one place, um, you put together some ideas, there's a whole that whole lot that goes into that, um, and then the end result. Uh, so the tool we use primarily um, is a program called Revit. Um, sure, there is some hand drafting um, and ideas that we um, sketch through on with pen and paper, but a lot of our work is uh, digital. It's on, on a computer. And this program um, is uh, it's very robust. Basically, what we're doing is we're creating digital versions of the building. So all of the structure, all the floors, all the walls, um, all the mechanical equipment, all the, the, the plumbing fixtures, it all gets built into this digital model. Um, and it helps us produce the floor plan that helps produce the elevations, the sections, all the things that go into the documents um, for the contractor um, to build. Um, 
And it's not just us, it's not just the architect, it's the structural engineers, it's the mechanical engineers, um, plumbing engineers. There's lots of um, different um, specialized people um, that work in these models um, to, to produce the documents. So here's some more examples of, um, of the sort of product um, we put together. Um, so here's a floor plan of the, the new residence halls at U of O. This is the first of, of three buildings. Um, here's an example of what um, elevations look like. And then you have a whole lot of details. Um, and this is what the various um, um, contractors will use to put the building together. Um, and keep in mind, this is a, a very small uh, sample of what goes in the, into the documents. For a, a building of this size, you're, you're looking at a three or 400 sheet um, set of drawings. So there's lots and lots of documents that go into um, making a building. All right, so this is an example of a, a finished uh, interior space. This is that Roseburg Forest Products office building. And I um, um, brought this up to highlight the, in the end, the simplicity of, of a finished a finished space. You know, there's a clean ceiling, there's beautiful skylights, um, got these uh, ornamental light fixtures, but behind it, there's a whole lot of stuff, right? And really important stuff for making the building function. So um, you have ductwork to supply air to make the space feel cool or warm. Um, you've got drain piping. So when you flush the toilet, your business can go where it needs to. You've got condensate piping to, um, uh, to feed the mechanical units to supply the hot and cold air. You got conduit for um, uh, all your electricity to run through the outlets um, and to power all the light fixtures. So all of this is not necessarily designed by the architect, but is under the architect's purview, working with these different engineers um, to, to route their systems through the building. So in the end, you can get a finished space that looks exactly the way you want it. Um, and, and that's the bulk of, of the production of, of architecture is working with um, the consultants um, working with the contractor, working with the owner to to meld everything um, together into like the a, a whole, you know, a whole that everyone is is really happy with. Um, so what I'm working on now, um, unfortunately, is not beautiful Hayward Field, although um, I do get really nice views of it from the rooftop of um, the residence halls we're doing. Um, so this is a, a phased project. Um, so the first phase is under construction right now, and it's this building on the right. Um, uh, all three are residence halls. Um, and the, the next two, uh, I don't know if you're seeing my cursor, um, but the two buildings that are nested together on the left are going to be the second phase, which will start, um, well, the start is a, a question mark right now. We have with COVID, um, there's lots of um, reshuffling of schedules and priorities and all sorts of um, interests that um, get brought up. Um, so don't know where we're going to start right, right now, but I think it's going to be um, within a year. Um, so building A, uh, this is what it's going to look like. And then there's going to be a new green space uh, in the in the front, uh, and here's a side by side of the 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 concept uh, and the in progress construction. So it's at the point where it's really fun to see 
the, the renderings become reality. It's not quite there yet. We don't have all the, the cladding on, um, but you get to see the form in, in, um, in person. Um, and it's, it's very exciting to start to see and feel the spaces. Inside, there's gonna be a, um, a dining hall that is designed as a, a public market. So there's gonna be multiple vendors uh, offering different types of um, cuisine. So there's a pizza place, there's uh, an Asian vendor, there's a deli counter, there's a taco stand, um, there's a, a juice bar. Um, so a real variety of the um, types of cuisine offered. Um, all set within this really nice double height space. It's going to have awesome light coming from the south, really cool seating spaces. Um, so again, the, the, the conceptualization and the in-progress work. Um, and to end, I uh, also want to share some, some thoughts on what I enjoy so much about um, this profession. Um, and it, it starts with the, the people. Um, it is extremely collaborative. Um, and um, the people tend, this is a generalization, of course, there's outliers, but architects and designers, interior designers, landscape designers, all tend to be very, um, well, one, intelligent. They're extremely creative. They're um, just like nice people to be around and work with. Um, and that's really important when working a job uh, because it takes up a lot of your time and not just time, but it takes up your mental space. And um, being around people that um, challenge you um, and encourage you um, is, is something to consider. Um, anyway, so just a, a nice environment to be in is uh, the message I want to get across here. Um, and then it can be fun. Uh, I've had the, the privilege um, at my previous firm, but also at Raul Broca, getting to do activities outside of work. Um, firms like to be involved in their communities through philanthropy, through different activities. Um, so this is uh, uh, me and some of my former colleagues playing in a kickball tournament for an organization called Playworks. Uh, and then uh, occasional office party or um, outing, uh, just getting together and enjoying each other's company. Uh, and then I also want to echo Mark's sentiments of the, the profession um, evolving and, um, and how you're constantly having to learn new things. Um, not just day to day um, with your uh, with your task. You know, one day I might be drawing details. The next day I'm in the field talking with contractors. The next day I might be um, putting together this pie in the sky kind of idea for a project that may never happen. But it's all within uh, the job description. And so I like that variety um, day to day, but also throughout one's career, um, technologies changes, uh, change, um, building practices change. Um, and so it's just, it's constantly making you um, uh, think and, and relearn. Um, and there's no like, there's no end. And, and that's, that's frustrating, but also very exciting. Uh, just this constant continuum of, of learning. Um, and so I welcome the challenge um, and I think it, um, well, it has made for an exciting career so far and um, gives me confidence that um, I can be like Mark 20 or so years down the road and feeling the same amount of excitement. Cool, thanks. It's fun hearing from you guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me go ahead and share um, my screen here. So, um, my, uh, I guess career path or journey to architecture, um, is not at all <laughs> straight line. <laughs> like Andrew, my background is in visual arts. 
Um, but uh, my, you know, my my dad was an architect, and um, growing up, he really encouraged me to do creative things. And he really probably would have rather been an artist, but you know, had had a family and needed to to have a, a a well steady paint job. So he was an he was an architect. And um, I think he really supported me pursuing art. Um, and he passed away when I was 18. So in 2005. Um, and it took almost 10 years for me to kind of come full circle. Um, and also just kind of find the courage and the clarity to decide to pursue architecture. And my 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 um, path there was actually really similar to Andrew's in that I um, really loved art and doing creative things. Um, studied visual art in college as an undergraduate student, um, and graduated in two thousand eight, right around the recession. And so that kind of, with a liberal arts degree in the recession, it was pretty tough to find you know an art based. Um, career, or, you know, really uh, secure job. So I did a lot of different things um, for about seven years. I, I was a substitute teacher um, in public schools for a while. I um, did floral designer <laughs> um, work. I did graphic freelance graphic design. Um, a, my brother and his girlfriend at the time, who's now his wife, opened a little um, like art shop together and had some, you know, resident artists that would rent space there. Um, we did a lot of different things and kind of throughout all that experience, I think I realized, wow, you know, all the stuff that I really enjoyed doing and some of these new skills, leadership skills that I was discovering kind of gave me the confidence to, to, uh, to see that architecture was actually gonna be a great way to combine all those skills and also, um, and also address the things that I care about, like, um, you know, art and culture and social equity and the housing crisis, which is happening all over the place. And I was in uh, Berkeley, California at the time, which is where, where I grew up. Um, and, you know, climate change is a big issue. And you'll learn that, you know, buildings really the, contribute to um, greenhouse gas emissions, which means it's a double-edged sword. We have a huge responsibility, but also a lot of opportunity to, to learn and, and do things better. So I just felt like, oh, it was like an aha moment. I realized, oh yeah, like this is an interdisciplinary uh, um, career that is really stimulating in a lot of different ways. Um, and in, in another way, I like to think of it as a career for people who want to do something creative, but really just can't decide <laughs> what they want to do. Um, and that kind of, that, that was kind of me. And I know some other people who feel the same way, um, just that they, you know, they, they want to do different things. They get pulled in different directions and it's tough for them to decide, well, I just want to be an artist and just paint all the time. Um, or no, I, I really want to, you know, make movies or no, I really want to, you know, uh, help people and it's kind of touches on a lot of those different things so that's that's what eventually brought me back to school to go ahead and um, get my graduate de degree at U of O so that experience is what I'm going to focus on since I'm um, not yet a licensed architect I'm working um, towards that as I uh, work at Raul Broca um, and since it's still very fresh in my mind I can share a little bit of that experience with you so um, this uh, on the left is what kind of your typical um, U of O Lawrence Hall studio would look like during non-pandemic times. Um, it's a lot of, you know, interacting and helping each other and big, lots of messes, <laughs> different, different people spread out on their desks and everyone's working on different things at the same time. Um, this was my desk the first summer. And it kind of becomes your home and you know as you as you learn especially if your background is not in architecture you you really it's, it can be really challenging and so this is a little cartoon i drew my first summer here where i i truly fell asleep on my desk <laughs> um a number of times that first summer um it really becomes your little um your own little slice of the studio it becomes your little mini apartment away from home um and uh, they start, you know, 
with a lot of kind of simple conceptual um, projects. So this is just a bunch of cardboard pieces you cut out and, to make a model and you, you draw a section of it. So getting the kind of basics of how we make drawings and a lot of, I love drawing. So a lot of my work involved um, just hand drafting things. Um, if we go back, you know, this is a an old school um, tool it's called a Mayline um, drafting board that you know, all architects used to draw all of their drawings by hand on something like this. Um, and so we started out using that just to um, learn the kind of what they call conventions of drawing. So all the ways that kind of you communicate architectural drawing, um, you know, really simple little paper folded models that, you know, you could do with a cereal box if you wanted to, um, just to study the way that light at different angles falls through, you know, skylights or windows. Um, oh, and also, you know, to challenge ourselves to think about architecture, not just as a stagnant photo or a stagnant image of a, of a beautiful space, but also that in real life, we experience architecture, um, you know, through movement and with perspective. And so kind of, this is an assignment that challenged us to, to make a drawing that somehow portrayed a space through, through time and space, which was kind of like a kind of moment we were all panicking, how do we do that? Um, we stayed up, you know, pretty late <laughs> working on our drawings, but I was happy with how it turned out. Um, and then as you get on um, in in the, the degree program, you do these design studio projects where you actually um, design a building either on your own or with um, partners. And, and you, you know, you do these different assignments where you're studying um, the way that light and different types of windows might affect the space. Um, you do all these little, you know, these are kind of to go back to the concept phase that Andrew talked about. Um, you know, if you love drawing, you, you do a lot of these just really quick hand sketches to kind of work things out and figure out what are the different experiences that we're trying to um, provide from within the space. Um, and um, sometimes your drawings can be really quick and simple like this. I mean, this was um, sort of a, uh, like almost like a midterm, you know, my final drawing for midterm, um, really loose, just, uh, but at relatively accurate, you know, it's scaled, which means that um, it's all proportioned to what it would be in real life. Um, and then to much more complicated drawings that, um, you know, show, the interior of the building in perspective. And I got really into these um, section drawings that were section perspectives because I felt like they really show, um, they give you an opportunity to really show the life of a space um, inside the building and not just the technical aspects of it. Um, so while you're in school, you really have, uh, what's fun about it is you can really focus on that conceptual stage. And as you develop, the more technical ideas of your building, you, you can still kind of um, be more illustrative and, and loose with your drawings. Um, this was my, my one of the uh, images that I created for my final project. And this was a project um, that created a, a center for maritime um, research and collaboration in Seattle. Um, basically the idea was to get um, commercial fishermen and marine biologists and the public to all kind of intermingle in this building where people were repairing their um, their their fishing boats and also developing new technology and also studying um, the effects of climate change on fish populations and then educating the public. So it was a pretty complicated but really fun project. Um, and then you do a lot of crafty model stuff. <laughs> um, uh, I think my drawings are of a, a higher caliber than my models, but you still learned a lot and had fun um, working on these kinds of things. And one of my favorite projects um, was actually one of the more technical ones in structures, which was building this um, tower. It was a it was a, a, a two person project, and um, you know one of the things that really intimidated me about architecture growing up was that I thought it was really hyper technical and mathematical and I just kind of shied away from it. It really intimidated me and that kept me from pursuing it. Um, and it's really too bad. I mean, in the end, you know, I, I got my interdisciplinary uh, liberal arts degree and I think it has really helped me. But um, 
what in the end, what I actually really enjoyed in school was learning some of the more technical things. Um, so here we are, we had to build this tower to scale. So this is like a mini, a little miniature two by four. <laughs> um, and we had to drill, we, we decided to drill these holes and put all these tiny little <laughs> pegs, dowels into the thing to hold it together because we were not allowed to use glue. Um, and we o could only use natural material like, um, you know, like fibrous, like thread. And so, <laughs> We um, went ahead and, you know, tied it all together with this cord and we put all of these dowels in. our hands were all sore and we, you have, everyone had to attach it to this base. And then what we did in structures class was, you know, you have like 50 different groups um, with all kinds of different tower projects and you had to bolt it down and, and you loaded it with a little sandbag and then you loaded it to the side. Um, and you, we just pour sand into this bucket until it breaks. So, <laughs> so it was a pretty fun uh, project. And I'm going to share a little video um, of our project. Uh, here we go. You can hear it cracking. So, <laughs> so that is um, probably one of the highlight <laughs> highlight projects um, that we that we did in school um, was this little experiment. So you know, it's a lot of good memories. Um, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, but if it sounds like something that interests you, I would highly recommend you know practicing your drawing skills and keep crafting and making your models and stuff and. Yeah, look at buildings and try to try to look at the world around you with fresh eyes. And um, you know, so much of it was was constructed by people. So um, look at it with fresh eyes. Look at it with critical eyes. You know, and uh, yeah, that's that's all we've got. If you have questions, it looks like we have a bunch here. This is great. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I was like, really enjoying the, the suspense of the video <laughs> of your tower. So there you go to everyone watching. Congratulations. Yeah, I hope, I hope <laughs> everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, that was great. Um, so I can, we do have a lot of great questions. Um, I can pick out a couple or if there are ones that, you know, want to take a crack at and feel like you're really wanting to answer. Um, I do think you did answer a lot of them, which was awesome. Um, I would say, okay, so we got one. What classes could I take in high school that would help me prepare for architecture? I think would be a good one. Yeah. Um, it's funny, Mark's working on the North Eugene High School, so he's more familiar right now than, than we are with what's, what kind of curriculums are actually available. But um, one thing that I, I feel like was a mistake was in high school, you know, you kind of like progress through your math classes. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I had at one point I had a choice between, um, at one point I had a choice between calculus and physics. And I really wish I had taken physics because I think it would have been more fun. And I think, and then it also at U of O at least is a prerequisite. So I would have had that just totally like out of the way. Um, it was a prerequisite for that structures class that I just shared. Um, and yeah. then of course- oh, I, was, I was just gonna chime in and, um... A, a lot of programs, if not all architecture programs, will have prerequisite class requirements. Um, so if you're interested, it, that would probably be the place to start is just to look at a few programs and what the requirements are. Um, 
but I, I, it was forget what type of math it was that I had to go back and take. Um, but yeah, physics was, was one, um, but I just take a look at what the requirements are and that might help guide, um, some class selections. Yeah. I, I would say if your high school has anything remotely geared towards architecture or might touch upon it, like a digital media class, I think I mentioned, you know, back in my day, it was drafting. So it was hand drafting. And we started by, you know, drawing little screws and widgets, but eventually we did houses. And that's what initially got me into it. Uh, so I know some of the classes, even I, I think the North Eugene High School wood shop, they, you know, they get into, they built the staircases and, you know, making things is, is really another entree into it. Um, and then there are some summer programs. I, I'm not sure how the summer academy relates to SAIL or if it's the same thing, but I know there, the summer academy at U of O has, has like a, is like a um, place where even high school students can experience an architecture program. Um, I had the experience where I grew up, I, I grew, also grew up near Berkeley. So I, there was a summer school program there that I was able to take a, an architecture class there. And, and it sort of gives you an idea of maybe the thought processes to see if you actually even like that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I think maybe, oh, sorry, Serena, maybe you can say what you're gonna say, but I wanted to also toss out um, a question about portfolios. So thinking about preparing. Yeah, that's actually yeah. what I just I, I, Nice, I, okay. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was digging through because I, I have oh, some nice. portfolios. Um, so this is, uh, it won't be so, so helpful um, on a little video screen. Um, this is, I think, what I submitted for um, U of O. Um, but basically, it's, it's a, um, a, a booklet. Um, I actually don't know if they have print booklets anymore, but it's, yeah. it's a series of slides of your, your creative work. Um, and so I benefited from having um, a lot of visual, um, visual work from high school and college. So, um, you know, there's, uh, well, and I did the summer program. So here's some like, well, there it is, some slides from when I went to the U of O Summer Academy. Um, and it has like a little description of, of what the project is. Um, also have some of my like sculpture from college. Um, mm -hmm. Again. drawings, things of that nature. Um, but for folks who went to school who say have a background in literature or there was a dentist in my program who wanted to switch careers, um, they may not have a lot of, um, you know, slides of, of this nature. So they would submit the, like their creative writing work samples or uh, model teeth that they had to make uh, or just, <laughs> Any way you can you can show your creative thinking, and it doesn't need to be visual. It could be written. It could be video. Um, is what goes into a portfolio. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it expresses your 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 think your creative thinking essentially. Yeah. Well, and it, and it can be um, like I, there's people in my program who, you know, created uh, created stuff to put in their portfolio because they were also doing a career change and didn't have like a ton of artwork or something and. Um, and, you know, so even those like little paper models that I showed you the pictures of, like things like that, where you're, you're showing that you um, are interested in, you know, crafting things in space and um, photography, you know, like pictures of buildings that you took is also um, a way to show your creative eye. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's basically just a collection of images that are showing work that you've done and showing kind of uh, like kind of who you are through, you know, images or, or writing. Um, and I, I was going to say that in terms of how to prepare for, uh, you know, getting into school, kind of no matter what you're doing, I think um, the ability to, to write really clearly is going to be super valuable. And it, be, it really comes in handy. Like Mark said, he didn't think he'd be doing any writing in architecture, but actually, you know, it's a big part of how we communicate with all those different people that we communicate with on a daily basis. And also it's how we also get work, you know, is, is by being able to clearly um, articulate our ideas through, also through words. So practice writing and, and, you know, get help from your mentors and stuff when you're doing your letters. 
there, there's a um, somewhat related question that made me think of, uh, you know, where, where do you find your niche in architecture? And that's one of the great things about it is that you, there, there is a place for people with different skills and interests. I, I, you know, I wouldn't be intimidated if you're not great at math or even if you don't think you're creative, but you like to problem solve and you like to, you like to um, get get things made, <laughs> I guess. Because I, unlike um, Andrew and Serena, I, I, I came at it without any art background or anything. And maybe a little more math background, but really about an interest in, in making things. And a lot of people actually come into it from the construction side. You know, they grew up building houses and stuff and they wanna start creating houses. So, and then some people like to manage people because we manage a lot of groups of people and some people just um, like to like to organize things. <laughs> and there's a place in architecture for that too. As long as you ultimately like to create places, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like Serena said, there, you know, there's social justice aspects to it, environmental aspects. So people are coming at it from a whole lot of different places. I mean, I, I actually think the, the liberal arts background, if you have the, the ability to, to go through that is a really great basis. And not just for architecture, for, for, for anything, but it's really about um, critical thinking and problem solving and communication. And those are, that's a lot of what architects do is communicating. Now we do it in a really specialized way and, and you need, do need to learn that, but the essence of it is really about um, uh, communicating and analyzing and, and creative thinking. And the, the gateway kind of goes both ways, right? You have people who study architecture and end up doing engineering or end up yeah, doing construction. Yeah, right, right. So it's a great way to get kind of a, an overall, a very kind of a well-rounded um, view of, of the whole building profession. And then, and then there's, there's all kinds of, you, you find what you're good at and what you enjoy. And that's kind of how you end up finding your niche. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you all so much. I I like, I want to do a part two. I feel like we have so much more to talk about. Um, so thank you so much for sharing um, all about your work and about all of the um, buildings in town. I feel like we can go on a little walking tour now and, and think about all of the things um, that go into those wonderful buildings. So that's really fun. Um, because Serena, you mentioned writing and communication, I do want to put in a pitch for our next um, college and career workshop. We have an essay writing workshop on December 2nd. So if any of you out there is thinking about essays or if you have just want to think about writing and written communication, that would be a great one to tune into as well. We'll have some U of O faculty that will be there. Same time, same place. So um but otherwise, I want to thank you three, and I'm sure everyone watching too. This is a huge thank you, and from Sale for coming in and talking with us, and it's just really been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. It's been, yeah, thanks. been that fun. Was fun. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna. I will end the stream real quick.